unlimited power. Oh, and spoilers. Welcome to the channel, I'm Hayes, I talk movies all day, so subscribe right now if you want to be entertained and today I want to talk about Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith, the 2005 third and final movie in the Star Wars prequel trilogy. And for those who don't know how this goes, I'm going to go through the movie, point out all the reasons I can find as to why it's trash and then at the end, drop a few final thoughts. So the film starts off with making you read. Ugh. I guess the one good thing about this is that Star Wars fans should have a higher than average reading comprehension. Hmm, maybe they should start Star Wars movies with Twitter posts, since some of you men clearly don't got no manners on that platform. Anyway. It says there are heroes on both sides, but evil is everywhere. Now the evil is everywhere bit makes sense, but who are the heroes on both sides? There's barely any heroes on the Jedi side. Palpatine got kidnapped and the Jedi go to rescue him. All this time and they still think Palps is a good guy. So I get that this is still before A New Hope, but you'd think with all that technology they'd have a much better way of communicating with droids over a long distance. You know, something that doesn't alert the enemy to their presence. How long are the lightsabers? Because when Obi-Wan and Anakin turn to fight the droids, they stay in the same position, yet they manage to take out the droids at the back, and I'm not sure the lightsabers reach that far. Also, with all the lightsabers swinging in that small area and two Jedi standing right next to each other, Obi-Wan and Anakin died in this scene. When Anakin is hanging off the ledge, the droids tells him, hands up Jedi, which obviously he can't do, because he only has one hand. Of course R2-D2 has oil slick, of course he does. Obi and Annie walk into a room where Palpatine is and the chair turns when they enter. Bear in mind Palps is supposed to be the prisoner, so why would he be doing the bad guy chair turn? And they still don't suspect him? When Palpatine says, you're no match for him, he's a Sith Lord, Obi-Wan says, Sith Lords are our speciality. How? Two movies ago, they didn't even know the Sith were back and since then, he's lost one fight with Sith and pretty much got lucky with the other, so how exactly are they your speciality? Unless you mean you specialise in losing to them, which of course he does, again. Palpatine tells Anakin to kill Count Dooku and leave Obi-Wan behind, and they still don't suspect him. Are they even paying attention? The elevator wasn't working and Anakin tells R2-D2 to activate it. Now that doesn't happen, but the thing is, if you're under attack, the elevator is one of the worst places you can be and the fact that it was already not working, why would you take that risk? Connie just uses Jedi magic to flow everybody up to a different floor? Obi-Wan got knocked out and had to be carried by his apprentice. Do you have a plan B? You don't get to be snarky fam. The gown that Padme has on doesn't look stable enough to stay on while sleeping. I mean I'm not saying they should have her titty pop out in the movie, just saying. It would make sense. But her hair should definitely be messy. She ain't queen no more. She don't get to have hairstylists keep her on fleek all night while sleeping. Anakin tells Yoda about his dreams. Yoda says, The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. That may be true, but how is that helpful? Yoda is a waste man, I swear down. Yoda tells Anakin to train himself to let go of everything he fears to lose, which sounds like good advice, and maybe it is to some degree, but everything? Really? Seems a bit extreme. Also, doesn't Yoda fear that Jedi might lose? So he's either so arrogant he doesn't believe that possible, or has he trained himself to let go of that? And if he has, then why would you want someone on your team who legit doesn't care what the outcome is? That's a liability. Obi-Wan tells Anakin he missed a report. Anakin says, I'm sorry, I was held up. I have no excuse. But you do have an excuse. You were held up. Are you dumb? It took two movies and 35 minutes for the Jedi to finally start suspecting Palpatine might not be on the level. And what was it that caused the suspicion? Was it his obvious quest for power? Nope. Was it the fact he never had enough chairs for everyone to sit down? Nope. Was it the fact that he didn't even hesitate when telling Anakin to kill Count Dooku? No. After everything, the thing that raised the Jedi's eyebrows was Palpatine requested to speak with Anakin and not saying why. Really? 
How is that unusual when apparently Palpatine has been given Anakin guidance in the 10 years between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones? Does he have to state the reason every single time he wants to talk to someone that he's known since they were a kid? So the Jedi insult Anakin by allowing him on the council but not granting him the rank of master. Then they send him on a secret mission to spy on the one person who's been consistent with him throughout. Who thought that was a good idea? When Mace Windu says it's dangerous putting Anakin and Palpatine together, Obi-Wan says, is he not the chosen one? Mace then replies, so the prophecy says. Then Yoda says, a prophecy that Miss Red could have been. And wait a minute, after two movies and 40 minutes, now you want to throw out the idea that a prophecy might be BS and not everybody believes it anyway? Now? After claiming to be so in love with her, Anakin got mad at Padme for expressing a political opinion that he didn't agree with. Actually, that's a pretty accurate prediction of the future. So here's the thing, we know Palpatine is a bad man, the Jedi are finally suspecting him of being a bad man, but as far as the story goes, Palpatine is still undercover, yet he does the most bad guy thing ever in this scene. Anakin turns up late but is still let into the theatre with no issue. Palpatine then proceeds to talk shop with Anakin and no one tells him to be quiet. Palpatine then tells the others to leave and they all get up without question. So yeah, if it wasn't clear before, Palpatine is gangster. Furthermore, when he tells Anakin that they found Grievous, bro, that could have been a phone call. But of course, that's not the real reason Pabs wanted to see Anakin. It was really so he can plant ideas in his head about saving people from dying using ancient Sith magic. Now, the fact that Palpatine knew that Anakin was worried about Padme and the Jedi didn't means one of two things. Either Palpatine is way more powerful with the Force than all the Jedi Council, or the Jedi are just useless. This bit is subtly brilliant. Anakin is saying the Sith are selfish and the Jedi are selfless, but you can tell on his face that he don't even believe that himself. So these guys are supposed to be clones, right? Because they don't look like clones. Pretty sure they ain't even the same height or width. Also, Clone Cody says to Obi-Wan, come on, when have I ever let you down? Which may be true, but surely they ain't known each other long enough for that statement to have any real value. When Obi-Wan turns up looking for Grievous and a grey man was all like, nah, ain't no war here fam, then right afterwards tells Obi-Wan Grievous is on the 10th floor. What was the point of that? Either Grievous can hear them or he can't. Either way, grey man just wasted everybody's time. No way Obi-Wan snuck out of the ship without anyone noticing. He couldn't even follow Django without getting spotted by a child. So not only did this giant dragon horse thing just happen to be be there for Obi-Wan to ride, it was also trained to recognize Obi-Wan's whistle call. Seems a bit convenient. Remember what Obi-Wan said to Anakin about not losing the lightsaber? After this, he should tell himself off. Why was Grievous made with such a flimsy breastplate? Nobody thought that would be a problem? It's been two movies, one hour and eight minutes and Finally, the Jedi know Palpatine is a Sith Lord, but they still want to keep Anakin out of it. Or should I say, they want to keep him in the dark? Bro, you men would still be bowing down to Darth Sidious if it wasn't for Anakin. You don't get to be acting like you know what you're doing when you clearly don't. This bit is actually brilliant though. It's Anakin realizing what he has to do and mourning the loss of himself. Because no matter what happens next from this point on, he's no longer Anakin the Jedi. Mace Windu turned up with three Jedi to arrest Palpatine. He came to arrest him and didn't even have any evidence. Didn't even tell him why he's being arrested. Just turn up at man's doorstep like, you're coming with me. I'm just saying, that's how you know this is a sci-fi. When Mace Windu is by the window and knocks Palpatine down, he was standing here. But just moments later, after Anakin turned up, he's now standing here. So why did he walk backwards? So it turns out that the clone army who one movie ago the Jedi knew nothing about because they're being made in secret but still decided to use them instead of questioning further how they came to be, were made with a cold trigger that at any point would switch their allegiance to Darth Sidious. And the Jedi couldn't sense that coming? During the Order 66 montage, Yoda is the only one who felt the change in the clones. Really? Yoda? <sighs> okay. Also, none of these kids look like they grew up to become Reaver. This kid gave his life so that Sons of Anarchy could escape, but they were gonna let him leave anyway. Kid probably should have listened to what was being said before jumping in trying to be a hero. Cody asks if they found Kenobi and is told, no one could have survived that fall. The amount of time something happens that somebody thinks is impossible, you'd think by now they just stop assuming things. Furthermore, no one could have survived that fall 
Dude fell into a lake, it's not a hard thing to survive. Anakin tells Padme to wait for him to return from the Mustafar system. Mate, what else has she been doing throughout this whole movie? I mean, I know she's up to duff and gotta take it easy, but this is a former queen, a former senator, and now she's not much more than stand still, look pretty, and let the insecure, whiny ass, bitch ass, conditioner without shampoo using man child to take care of everything. That's the second time someone let R2 D2 roll for a distance before telling it to stay with the ship. At this point, R2's gotta be plotting some kind of robot revolution. Padme says, This is how liberty dies with thunderous applause. And actually, that was a pretty accurate prediction of the future. Yoda tells Obi-Wan to use his feelings to find Anakin. In the next scene, Obi-Wan turns up at Padme's house. Mate, I don't think Yoda meant those feelings. Obi-Wan tells Padme that he's seen a video of Anakin killing younglings, and Padme says, not Anakin, he couldn't. They're dead, and not just the men, but the women, and the children too. And I slaughtered them like animals. Really? There was no good reason for Padme to turn down Typho's offer to help. Also, what happened to her baby bump? Obi-Wan was hiding under the ramp and waited for Padme to enter the ship before sneaking aboard. Thing is, since the ramp was already down before Padme turned up, Obi-Wan could have just went into the ship and hid somewhere inside. Also, why does Padme have a whole giant spaceport when apparently her apartment has its own ship docking? That just seems excessive for someone who isn't queen anymore. Like seriously, who's paying for all this? It's actually kind of crazy that this part of the galaxy has all this amazing technology, but no one has invented a color video phone yet. Plus the sound quality is terrible. So what, they don't have 4G internet either? I will do what I must. You will try. Obi-Wan drew his saber first. The fight between Obi-Wan and Anakin was done really well, showing how evenly matched they are while also showing how Anakin has let his anger cloud his judgement. Now the fight between Yoda and Palpatine had way too many close ups and long distance shots and yeah, I get why it's done like that but the end result is, it looks terrible on screen. And considering the Yoda vs Dooku fight was done with so much more finesse, it's like, what happened? Did somebody on the stunt team get fired or something? When the clone tells Palpatine there was no son of Yoda's body, Palpatine's assistant right away said, then he's not dead. Finally, somebody who doesn't assume things just to avoid doing actual work. Yoda gets his ass kicked once then goes running into hiding. Bitch. By the way, how are they not feeling the heat in that place? And Obi-Wan still has neat hair. With one slash, Obi-Wan took off both Anakin's legs and one arm. Does that seem right to you? Now I ain't no medical, scientifical, etymologicalist or whatever, but that belly don't look big enough to be carrying twins. Also, shouldn't these droids have removed Anakin's clothes and sedated him before making him more machine now than man? I mean, I'm not saying they should have his dick out in the movie, I'm just saying it would make sense. Also, I'm not sure a scream like that comes out of a closed mouth. People make fun of this, but it actually makes sense. Just cause you got a cool, new, deep voice, don't mean you stop being a whiny bitch. I know he said he and his wife have talked about adopting a girl, but even still, don't you think you should still talk it over with your wife first? But even worse than that, Obi-Wan turns up at Owen and Baru's house and dumps a baby on them without any indication they'll be okay with it. To be fair, it does come full circle since the whole thing started with the Jedi taking Anakin away from his mother without asking her first, and concludes with the Jedi dropping off baby Luke without asking Owen and Baru first, so... Anyway, the movie ends with Palpatine and Darth Vader staring out at what is to become the Death Star Battle Station. But the real question is, why is Darth Vader still hanging around? He said he'll do what Palpatine asked as long as they can save Padme. And, well, that didn't happen, so why are you here? Alright, so before I get into my final thoughts, if you liked this movie, check out these movies. They're all films where a good guy becomes a bad guy, some more shocking than others, but without giving away any spoilers, I'm just gonna say personally, I was not surprised by what happened in Scooby-Doo. I knew that guy was bad from day one. So what went wrong with Revenge of the Sith? With Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, they did pretty much what they needed to do in order to tell the story of Anakin's journey to the dark side. And the same can be said for Revenge of the Sith. It does pretty much what it needs to do. But perhaps what becomes apparent with Revenge is that three movies wasn't enough. Or maybe it should have been twice as long because the film is two hours and 20 minutes and still manages to feel like a rush job. And maybe, just maybe, if they hadn't wasted so much time on that drag race in the first movie, they might not have had this problem. 
Just saying. The main thing that had to happen in Revenge is Anakin's actual turn to the dark side, which does happen. His desire to keep Padme alive being the main catalyst that pushes him to the dark side made sense because of what happened in the previous films. But the fact that the Jedi spent so long bumbling around and the only reason they found out Palpatine is a Sith Lord is because he told them, well he told Anakin but still. These guys are supposed to be the guardians of peace and justice. How? Everything they did pushed Anakin further and further away and for all their search your feelings and sensing much confusion, not one of them realised their methods were not working. But let's talk about Padme for a minute because I think most people notice Jar Jar Binks went from prominently featured to just a few scenes to I think I saw him but Misa not sure. But I don't see too many people talking about how Padme went from integral character to object of Anakin's creepy obsession to plot device. She is literally the reason Anakin feels he needs to follow Palpatine yet she has next to no impact on the story outside of baby making. And by the way, are we really supposed to believe that she was so upset with Anakin that she simply just lost the will to live? Even after giving birth and naming her children, she just gave up living. Really. Queen Amidala. Senator Amidala spent most of her life trying to make a better galaxy for the people, decoys dies to protect her and her work. After everything she's had to overcome and battle through, has one shitty husband and decides she don't want to live anymore. Really? George? What kind of message are you trying to say? But yeah, it still did pretty much what it needed to do. And it definitely had a few moments of brilliance. I've already mentioned a few scenes with Anakin, but also Ian McDermott switching from Chancellor Palpatine to Darth Sidious. There's a slight change in his voice that comes through. In particular, the scene where he's revealing himself to Anakin, his voice goes from Palpatine to Sidious and back to Palpatine. And in the beginning, when Palpatine tells Anakin to kill Count Dooku, Dooku looks over to Palpatine in disbelief, but doesn't say anything. Now we know why that is, but at this point in the movie, the Jedi don't. So he looks over at Palpatine, signifying his initial shock that his master would have him killed, but his silence shows that he is still fully dedicated to Palpatine. It's a subtle way of showing how much power and control Darth Sidious has over his apprentices, of which Anakin is about to become. So when the prequels were released, they by and large took a lot of flack for very many reasons. Some reasons were valid, some not so valid. But I think the truth is, and this might be a little controversial, I think the truth is they really did the best they could at the time. Well, I mean, maybe not the best they could, but between trying to make films for a new generation of Star Wars fans while trying and failing to not piss off the original fans, while trying to tell a story that was somewhat known to the public, but also realizing and it's 20 something years later and maybe a few ideas have changed since they were originally thought of. The prequels had a lot of moving parts, many of which were moving in different directions and in hindsight, they were almost certainly never going to make something that would have been widely praised at the time. But what's interesting now is that now we're 20 ish years after the prequels were released, it seems people's general attitudes towards them have changed. Maybe it's because it's so many years later and all the hype has died down and now you can just watch and enjoy them for what they were. Maybe it's because the young kids who were experiencing Star Wars for the first time with the prequels are adults now and have fond memories of seeing those films with their family. Or maybe it's because after Disney put out their trilogy, everybody just collectively agreed that maybe the prequels weren't that bad after all. Whatever the reason is, I think by now we can all agree that a lot of Star Wars fans and maybe a lot of non-Star Wars fans owe Ahmed Best and Jake Lloyd an apology. But that's what I think of Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. What do you think of Star Wars Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith? Let me know down below and while you're there be sure to like, subscribe and drop a suggestion if you don't mind.